I'd like to welcome everybody to our March webinar on ocean thermal energy conversion. Um, this is something that I've been excited about for quite a while, and it's only recently that we've that I've kind of learned a little bit about this. Um, I've been asked by the island nation of Bermuda to help in their pursuit of renewable energy. And unfortunately, Bermuda isn't perfect for this, but Bermuda is a good example of a place that has a problem that they really need to solve, and that is they've got about 160 megawatts, I seem to recall, of uh, electricity that's generated with diesel. So they have to import extremely expensive diesel, and it, it, as you can imagine, even though they've got scrubbers on it and so forth, it makes a mess. And when the wind blows the wrong way, you've got, you know, particulates all over the, you know, you go out to your car and you can wipe them off with your finger. Um, so it's a, it's a, it's a mess. And uh, the Bermudans are wealthy and they're aggressive on this and they will make a change in this eventually. And uh, hopefully OTEC will be a, a, a portion of that. Um, I uh, hope that, um, uh, though having said that, it's not perfect as we'll learn a little bit about here. Um, we've got Jim Greenberg, who is the chief um, strategy and marketing officer for the company called Ocean Thermal Energy Corporation. So, do you, and Jim, welcome to the broadcast, by the way. Oh, well, thanks, Craig. I appreciate you having me. I'm glad to be here. Well, good. So, and how do you pronounce the name? Do you, do you call it OTEC Corporation? How do you, how do you say it? Uh, we normally say uh, uh, OTE Corporation for short. OTE it's still a little lengthy, but that's as short as it gets right now. <laughs> well, that's just fine. All right. Well, very good. I want to uh, remind everybody, uh, please feel free to enter questions, field as many as we can as we go through this. So what I've asked Jim to do is just to present a kind of high-level viewpoint of, of OTEC generally um, and a kind of corporate presentation, I guess you could say. Um, so, do you, Jim, you want to just take, kind of take us through this, and I'll just ask questions, and I'll obviously uh, read from anything that um, uh, our guests put in. Fire away. Sure. Um, well, uh, you know, as you indicate here, uh, a billion people uh, live in the tropical regions, which, of course, is the wide geographic band uh, between the tropics of Cancer and Capricorn, and uh, you know one of the problems that many of these regions have uh, uh, are are two. Um, one is very high electricity cost uh, because they are almost entirely dependent on imported fossil fuels. Uh, a lot of these places burn diesel that is it's, it's itself very expensive, uh, plus then to ship it in, and it's getting increasingly expensive, and it makes it hard to, um, I mean, apart from uh, draining these economies substantially, it also makes them, it makes it difficult for these places to budget not having a fixed cost for energy, uh, and the volatility of oil is a major issue for them, and of course then there's also the water issue. Um, scarcity of fresh drinking water in a lot of these places. So uh, that's why OTEC is really a good fit, ideally for tropical zones, although as we can chat about probably in a little bit, um, OTEC, uh, ocean thermal energy conversion, uh, while it is ideally suited for tropical zones, Craig, um, we also have the ability to use waste heat uh, in conjunction with ocean thermal energy conversion plants. So you might call that taking any existing heat source uh, and um, using it to sort of supercharge the plant. Um, right. Yeah. Would it, would it be helpful at this point, perhaps, if, if I just paused and gave a, a brief overview of a little bit of the history of OTEC? Absolutely. How it works? We've got people yeah. writing in um, essentially demanding that. <laughs> okay. So let me just go to the next slide. Yeah, just to give a very brief history of ocean thermal energy conversion, uh, this is a technology which, as, as I like to say, uh, as a complete non-science person, is so uh, straightforward that even I can understand it. And the way it works um, is in the uh, tropical and, again, subtropical zones in some cases, 
uh, all year round, because of the intensity of the sun, the surface water remains very, very consistently warm. Um, obviously, it varies exactly what that temperature is going to be from location to location, but generally speaking, just for sake of example, we'll say the surface water uh, may be around 80 degrees Fahrenheit um, in a lot of these regions, uh, which is just another way of saying that a tremendous amount of the sun's solar energy, uh, the estimates are about 85% of that energy is actually absorbed by the uh, tropical surface waters of the ocean. So it's, it's a huge collection unit for solar heat just waiting there to be tapped into and used. So you have this 80 degree warm surface water and if you go just 3,000 feet straight down in the ocean in these regions, um, which by the way, 3,000 feet is not far at all by ocean engineering standards. Obviously, obviously you have offshore oil rigs that, that go far deeper than that and use piping uh, to do it, um, but if you go 3,000 feet straight down from the 80 degree surface water, uh, you will tap into cold deep ocean water that's generally around 40 to 45 degrees Fahrenheit. So you have in close proximity a heat source and a cold source, and that is what allows electricity to be drawn. Uh, and the way it works, and, and by the way, this was proven uh, 20 years ago on the Big Island of Hawaii with Department of Energy funding. Um, and the way this works uh, as far as a land-based OTEC plant goes is you have the plant located on a shoreline in one of these tropical or subtropical region, regions and it has to be on a shoreline in an area where the continental shelf drops off quickly from the coast because you have to be able to get to cold deep water. But you have the plant on the shoreline, and then essentially you just have two enormous pipes coming off of the plant, a, uh, a large warm water pipe and a large cold water pipe. And you take that 80 degree water, surface water in through the warm water pipe, and then through conventional heat exchangers, you know, all existing old technology, uh, that heat is transmitted to a fluid, uh, which in our case is uh, pure liquid ammonia, which has a very, very low boiling point, uh, so low that the 80 degree heat from the surface water will actually boil the ammonia, which of course creates steam, which turns a turbine generator to make electricity. Uh, and this is in a closed system, by the way. And then once you have the, uh, the steam that has turned the uh, turbine generator to make electricity, you, that steam is then um, um, exposed to the cold chill from the deep ocean water, that 40 to 45 degree chill, and that chill causes the steam to recondense back into liquid form, and it's in a closed system. You just run that through a continuous cycle. So it is 24-7 base load electricity, which is what is needed around the world, and wind and solar are great uh, and have their rightful place in you know, bringing renewable energy across the world, uh, but the limitation on those is they are intermittent, obviously, uh, you only get energy when the wind is blowing and the sun is shining, whereas OTEC is base load 24-7. That's, that's the way it works, and as long as the sun continues to heat the surface waters of the world's uh, oceans, we can use OTEC to, to produce electricity without the use of fossil fuels. And, and the other thing I want to add and just explain an overview here is we can, what we what we are doing is, in addition to building these OTEC plants in regions that have a scarcity of fresh water, we also put a water desalinization facility uh, right next door to the OTEC plant, and then we can use some of the electricity, clean electricity we're producing from the ocean, uh, and instead of putting it all into the grid, we can divert it to the water desal facility next door and use it to run a reverse osmosis system because we are bringing up literally millions of gallons of cold deep ocean water, and so we can use that same electricity to make clean water as well. So in, in a nutshell, Craig, what we're talking about here with this technology is making clean energy and clean drinking water uh, without uh, carbon emissions and all coming out of, you know, what's already there. It's tapping into nature. That's amazing. Well, let me ask you this. Um, 
Well, first of all, intermittency is an issue with solar and wind, but it's um, it's only one. I was talking before we started about Bermuda and how I've been charged with trying to come up with the proper solutions for them vis-a-vis -vis renewable energy. Um, and uh, my uh, what I've noticed there is that you know, for instance, if they if you want 160 megawatts of solar, that's a lot of room, and they don't have a lot of room. Um, so. Um, there are other issues that would make OTEC a wonderful solution for certain places like this. But here's another thing, is that the guy I know, um, Dr. Peter Lilienthal, whose, whose software is used to drive um, uh, grid operations in 80 different countries, uh, integrating renewables, um, famously told me, you know, it, 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 the real issue with clean energy is, is money. In other words, if you don't care how much you pay for it, I can get you lots of clean energy. So let me ask you this. This this sounds, I, I, I presume the reason we didn't do this long ago is that this is expensive. So can you speak to that, please? Uh, absolutely. You're, you're um, right on the mark there, Craig. The, 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 you know, one of the questions that came into my mind um, when I first got involved in this business and I saw that OTEC was this proven, straightforward technology. And, and by the way, I ought to add on the, on the point that it's proven, um, you know, the, the, uh, over the last 30 years, there's been about $330 million that has gone into proving OTEC. Most of it has come from the U.S. government, and this really started back in the 1970s when the oil embargo hit and the price of oil spiked and everyone started scrambling. And that really gets to your point, but then, of course, oil dropped again and interest was lost mm -hmm. uh, in, in renewable alternatives because they weren't cost competitive. Uh, but, you know, as, as I got into this, um, the major question in my mind, and I'm sure a lot of our uh, listeners and followers out there have the same question, is if this is a proven technology, it can do so much good in terms of clean energy and clean water uh, for the world, um, why hasn't it been done before? And the answer to that is there are three basic reasons. And the first one is uh, what you have raised, and that is because with the price of oil historically so low, uh, OTEC was not cost competitive. However, fast forward 20 years, with the price of oil where it is now, and particularly in OTEC markets, these, a lot of these, uh, as I said, tropical and subtropical communities, they are paying exorbitant prices for electricity. Uh, in a lot of the places we do business, they are paying between 40 and 60 cents a kilowatt hour, um, which, you know, compared to the U.S. mainland is just uh, un unbelievable. I, I don't know what you, what you pay out there. I think here in Pennsylvania we're paying around, in my region, around 10 cents a kilowatt hour. So, but the first factor is definitely the cost competitiveness. OTEC is more than competitive now. In the places we're doing business, we can provide them base load clean energy at a lower cost than what they're paying, plus give them a fixed price so they can budget for the next 30 years. These contracts are 30 years in length and not have to worry about the volatility of oil. So they, they really become energy independent is the uh, is the gist of it. The other couple of things I'll just mention and answer your question about, you know, why OTEC has not come to fruition or, or commercialization until now is because in addition to the uh, cost competitiveness issue, in the last 20 years, very ironically, there have been tremendous technological advances in the offshore oil industry that pertain to deep water piping, which have helped OTEC because the pipes are now bigger, uh, more robust, which makes OTEC even more competitive and can actually help with the, bring down the capital cost of a plant uh, and helps us scale up. And then, of course, the third factor that, that goes to your question is because 20 years ago when OTEC was proven, the consciousness of uh, global warming was very limited uh, as compared to today where uh, you know, climate change is much more accepted, not across all factions, but much more accepted and to the degree where there are many nations and even 
the state of Hawaii that now has renewable and energy standards, which all of that makes our tech more competitive. Uh, I mean, we don't need the renewable energy standards to be competitive. We can compete on cost alone in our markets, but on price alone, rather. But the renewable energy standards make it even uh, more OTEC, all the more tr attractive to meet those mandates. Interesting. Do you want to speak to this one? You've got this is part of the corporate uh, presentation. You've got plans. You've got projects. You want to speak to this briefly? Uh, yes, a couple of things here. Uh, first, I should probably mention that um, in addition to doing uh, OTEC or ocean thermal energy conversion, the other uh, the other projects that we are involved in are related projects called seawater district cooling. And um, for uh, those listeners who may not be familiar with that, uh, seawater district cooling is in a lot of ways just half an OTEC plant. And so an OTEC plant has two, two pipes um, going into the ocean, the warm water and the cold water, and the, it's energy producing. Seawater district cooling is not an energy producing plant. It's a plant on the shoreline that has just a cold water pipe, um, like an OTEC plant pipe, and then that cold deep ocean water is used as the non-polluting refrigerant for very large structures. Um, so for instance, in the uh, Bahamas, we have a project, we have a contract that is uh, underway now um, where we are providing a seawater district cooling facility that will do the air conditioning for um, a resort located uh, on Cable Beach. It's going to be multiple hotels, uh, and uh, there's a casino there. And by using that deep ocean water, it uh, saves about 80 to 90 percent electricity cost, which obviously is huge from an environmental standpoint. And um, uh, so that is, that's the other thing that, that we do that's mentioned on this slide. And uh, the locations there, Kona, Antigua, Mohur, and Saipan, uh, those are good locations to do OTEC. Um, and uh, OTEC is based on the, the locations where OTEC is uh, really feasible are where the water, the, the temperature differential between the warm water and the cold water is sufficient, or what they call the delta T, uh, which in terms of Celsius is around uh, 20 degrees. I think Fahrenheit, that's around a 36 degree difference. But also where, again, you have to have the continental shelf drop off. Uh, and then uh, if you have a situation where you have waste heat available, this is what we were talking about before, um, whether it's a, uh, could be a nuclear facility, could be a cement factory, could be an existing power plant, anything that throws off heat, we can take that heat and use it to further warm the water and get more uh, energy that way. So locations right now, there are about 99 countries around the world we have identified where all these factors come together that would allow us to uh, favorably do OTEC in those places. And these um, few that are listed here are, are among those. Okay, good. So, and when we met in Philadelphia, you talked about existing, I know, I know you just got back from um, the uh, Bahamas. So um, you've got a lot of stuff actually working right this minute. Yes. Yeah, we have, um, we, as I said, we have a contract in the Bahamas um, for an SDC plant. Uh, we have a uh, signed memorandum to move forward uh, with additional SDC faci other facilities in the Caribbean. We also have a uh, signed memorandum of understanding to move forward with two OTEC plants with Bahamas Electricity Corporation. The Bahamas are very uh, eager, understandably, to, uh, to, to get OTEC uh, moving for uh, you know, all the reasons that we've discussed. Uh, we have a signed uh, memorandum of understanding coming out of East Africa for multiple OTEC plants. Uh, we have a uh, signed preliminary power purchase agreement uh, with the Pacific Island utility as well. So, uh, you know, and this gets back to your point, Craig, your question about pricing. Right now, with the price of oil being where it is, and 
equally important where everyone's fearful that it's going, given the basic laws of supply and demand and world events, you know, we have customers really coming to us from all around the world who are eager to see this happen sooner rather than, than later. That's fantastic. Well, speaking of that, <clears throat> somebody wrote in and wanted to know if they can invest in your company. Can you speak to that? Um, yeah, I mean, that's, uh, there, there are certainly investment opportunities in the company, uh, and uh, the, for the person writing in or, or anyone else who would like to explore that, I would be happy to to uh, to have that conversation and share all that information with you when we that would be something obviously we can do in a separate uh, private conversation but there are there are multiple opportunities and they can just uh, reach out to me and drop me an email or give me a call either way and we can be happy to chat about that yeah, that'd be fine um, alternatively obviously they can just go on to green energy if you just hit contact and just send me something I'll make sure that that's fine uh, this slide indicating revenues exceed two billion dollars. Uh, that is um, based on the fact that each one of these power purchase agreements or uh, energy services agreements on the seawater district cooling side, um, generally speaking, are projected to produce revenues over the life of these contracts of about half a billion dollars. So, um, you know, one of the reasons, obviously, that OTEC now is ripe for commercialization is because of these, these economics um, and, you know, it, equally or more important than the economics of it at the, from the overall revenue side is just the overall economic development and the, and the job opportunities that come with that, and not just in the countries where we're doing business, where we do commit to using uh, local local labor and helping the economies that way, but also uh, here domestically in the U.S., uh, there's all kinds of sectors here for component part manufacturers um, that that will allow for economic development and job opportunities here in the states as well. And 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 I think from a bigger picture standpoint, you know, a lot of people in the business community. Um, I think rightfully believe that the next Google or Apple is going to come out of the renewable energy field because the, the energy market, the global energy market is huge. It is the largest market in, in the world. And um, to be at the leading edge of that just can do great things for our, our economy overall. So we're, we're very mindful of, of, of the overall good that this can do. Um, as for the second bullet point on, on the slide, um, oh, and by the way, I, I probably should mention, I, you know, I'm just talking about the, the global energy market. That doesn't even get into the global water market. Um, right. You know, if you boil it all down, Craig, I would say that <laughs> if you want to talk about markets and what the demand is for different products or services, um, there is no debating that the world population, which is increasing exponentially and industrializing, is going to have two greatly increasing demands. One of them is for energy, and it's, in particular, it's going to be clean energy as the economics of oil become uh, more and more prohibitive, and the other is going to be for fresh drinking water. So that's, that's exactly what, you know, OTEC can do, and that's the, that's the business that we're in. The second point on your slide here, Craig, as to the cold water pipe still operational, uh, that refers to, uh, as you uh, see here, that pilot plant, land-based pilot plant, uh, OTEC plant built in Hawaii back in the 90s with Department of Energy funding. Uh, our chief science officer was uh, there involved in that development at the time, and that plant operated successfully. They had a series of trials over about six years. Uh, where they proved OTEC could make uh, net power without fossil fuels. Um, the electricity producing portion of that plant was actually then um, 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 decommissioned uh, because it was not, it, the Department of Energy can't be an operating utility. The, the concept had been proven. However, the pipes, the cold water pipes, are still there, have been there, um, 
the oldest pipes have been there 20 years plus and have been in continuous operation for that whole period, including um, having given rise to a number of uh, profitable industries that have uh, sprung up around those pipes. Water bottling plants are there. There's uh, sustainable fish farming operations there. There's uh, a, a pharmaceutical opportunity. So there's all kinds of economic development and spin-off technology that come around OTEC. And I'd probably the other thing I ought to mention about those pipes uh, is that those pipes on in Hawaii have withstood um, numerous Category 4 hurricanes and even and earthquakes. So uh, these things have a long track record, and that's with the technology of the time. With the current, uh, as I said, advancements in the offshore oil industry, deep water piping, the pipes are even more robust today. Okay, here are a couple of questions from audience members. Um, the temperatures in and out, in other words, the hot and cold, I seem to recall you said it's, you know, the tropical, the hot water is in the low 80s and the cold water is 40 to 45, is that correct? That's correct. Depends on the location, but that's a pretty good uh, uh, general rule of thumb. Okay, so we, and you need to get to 3,000 feet. That's, you know, six-tenths of a mile. How far off the coast of Hawaii, for instance, do you have to go to get that? Um, I, I can't give you an exact figure in Hawaii, but the, I will tell you this. Um, it is, again, going to vary from location to location. Um, it, it, in Hawaii, as I recall, you get to cold, deep water pretty quickly. There are locations around the world where uh, literally, you, it, I mean, I, I don't want to give an estimate and be off base here, but um, it, it, it's going to vary, but I will say this, all the locations where we have identified as prime for doing business, one of the reasons is because the distance that you have to run that cold water pipe is economical. It's short yes. enough that the plant economics still work. Obviously, if you're, you know, for the, uh, for the, for the uh, uh, listener writing in, um, if you're in an area where you don't get the cold water in a short enough distance, cold deep water, the pipe becomes so long and it is the major cost component of an OTEC plant that the economics no longer work. Um, I would think. So, for instance, yeah. if you're in Miami, um, you can be, you know, 15 miles offshore and you're still in, you know, 80 feet of water or something like that. So there are there are places where this wouldn't work, but you've like, successfully identified 90 or so um, places where it will, and I guess that's the most important aspect of this thing. Um, another um, listener wants to know um, environmental consequences and potentially bio biofouling. Do you have uh, barnacles build up in these things and so forth? Um yeah, the, the, I, I'll speak to the environmental consequences first and, and the biofouling. And, I'm uh, again, I'll be quick to say I'm not the technical guy. I know, I think, the basics from our technical staff. Uh, but in terms of the environmental consequences, there are a couple of potential impacts that always need to be uh, addressed uh, with an OTEC plant. And uh, one of them is that the water after the, the water is run completely through the system and used for whatever secondary or tertiary uses it may be, um, then it is going to be, in most locations, not all, but most locations, it's going to be returned to the ocean. And we obviously have to make sure that we return the water um, at a temperature that is close enough to the ambient temperature so that it doesn't affect the marine life or upset the ecosystem in any way. And that is very easily achievable um, in, in the designs because it's a question of making sure that the return occurs at the uh, depth, at the proper depth, where we will be within ambient temperature. And then we also can control this because, we, of course, we're bringing in warm water and cold water, and we have the ability to mix those and different proportions to achieve whatever return temperature we want. So that is that is one environmental uh, potential concern, but it's, it's quite addressable. The other one is that um, 
You, we want to make sure that we uh, do not entrap marine life in the, um, in the in the piping. And when I say the piping, I probably should point out that we're not talking about that concern with respect to the deep cold water pipe uh, where that pipe is located, which is not far off the ocean floor. There's really minimal uh, marine life uh, in, in that location. So it's the warm water pipe we need to be concerned about. And the way we address that environmental concern is uh, there are really three different uh, things that we do. One is, of course, proper uh, meshing over the end of the pipe uh, is, 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 is a huge factor. Number two, we have to adjust the flow rate, how quickly that water is coming in the pipe so that the flow rate is slow enough that it allows marine life to basically outswim the flow rate, not get sucked in. And then the third thing that that we do is uh, the, the, our marine experts on staff have, uh, have educated me to the fact that apparently marine life has a difficulty uh, outmaneuvering a vertical uh, flow uh, as opposed to, say, a diagonal flow. So what we do is make sure that the intake pipe is at the proper angle so that the flow created is not only slow enough and that there's meshing, but that it is at the angle that uh, minimizes the chance of it being a problem for any marine life. Um, so those are the primary environmental concerns. Uh, let me just point out on that note, one of the things that definitely captured my attention when I was looking at this, and and, and, I, and I do come from a... Uh, a family where environmental concerns have been paramount. My brother was actually uh, with the Wilderness Society for many, many years, so that is, is definitely on my mind. But one of the things that struck me was when I saw that uh, one of the leading environmental groups in Hawaii, uh, it's called Life of the Land, uh, issued a report just in the last couple of years about Hawaii's energy future and the need for Hawaii to get uh, off of its addiction to oil for all the reasons we talked about before. And Life of the Land, in their, in their report, they put OTEC as the centerpiece to <clears throat> uh, enable Hawaii to move to clean, uh, self-sustaining energy coming out of their local resources. So I guess my point is I think the fact that a major environmental group, and that's just one example in a location that has these issues, a major environmental group, is such an OTEC supporter, says a lot about the overall environmental uh, concerns being things that really are very addressable and are not impediments to OTEC moving forward on that. As far as the biofouling goes, I can only speak to that uh, briefly. I think that is a question of uh, treating the water periodically with um, the, the uh, substances that are necessary, and it may be as simple as uh, partial chlorination periodically. I don't, I don't recall for certain, but I think that it's pretty straightforward to avoid the biofouling. Okay, that's interesting. Okay, a few more points here. Um, um, you know, I, again, it, it's I, I find this very strange that people, that extremely senior physicists and engineers and so forth can study something and come up with different responses. There are people who just really don't believe in the thermodynamics of this thing overall, but it, apparently they're in the minority. So in other words, you, 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 um, I know that your top gun technologically came from, was it Lockheed Martin? Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, one, one of our top science uh, people is uh, Dr. Ted Johnson. Uh, who, uh, before he joined us, was with Lockheed Martin for years as their um, director of renewable energy and OTEC development. Uh, Ted is a very, very passionate person about OTEC because he knows what it can do for the world and, and its time has come. But uh, he joined us because he saw that this is ready to be commercialized in the way that we're, that we're doing it, um, and he's eager to see it happen. So we're... We're delighted to have him on board. But, I, you know, I think, um, by the way, the other thing that I probably ought to point out, because I don't think we really covered this before, but when we're talking about OTEC having been proven and that we're commercializing it now, one thing that's important to note is 
we are building our plants in the uh, 5 to 10 megawatt range, um, uh, which is relatively small. But the reason for that is, one of the reasons for that is because those size plants can be built with all off-the-shelf components. Um, uh, these things can, uh, they don't have to be designed or tested. They are all existing. They've been used in many applications, many different applications. Uh, so what that means is that it makes these, the technology risk is considered low to minimal, uh, which is why these projects that we have are financeable. Uh, we have our financing in place both on the equity and the debt side for our projects. And that, that brings me really around to this slide and, and, and your question. I, uh, I, I, I suspect, I mean, I can't speak for those people who are out there uh, saying that OTEC is not feasible now and what reasons or perceptions they have, but I, I can guess what a couple of those may be. But I can tell you two things that are really important to note in response. One is, in uh, 2009, NOAA, the National Oceanogra Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, issued a report indicating that a 5 to 10 uh, megawatt uh, OTEC plant is feasible now. Uh, this is ready to go forward. And by the way, I should note that the NOAA report was talking about a floating plant. Um, we're doing land-based. Land-based is even more feasible, or to put it another way, less risky than floating platforms, which obviously have issues with storms and things like that that we don't uh, face with, with the land-based. Um, so, you know, in response to those who are questioning whether OTEC is really viable now, uh, technically, economically, I, I would say uh, NOAA says it is, and equally important are financiers who've looked at this pretty closely and are willing to put up the project financing for our plants, uh, there's no doubt in their minds that OTEC is, is uh, both technically and economically feasible. Um, having said that, I suspect that there are a couple of things going on here, Craig. Uh, I, I suspect that some of the people who are questioning OTEC um, from a scientific standpoint um, may do that because of, in part, it is a relatively lower efficiency uh, um, energy source. However, yes, that's exactly the point they're making. Well, it, it, it is, but, but you can't just look at that in a vacuum. The, it's lower efficiency and all of the fuel is free and inexhaustible and the places where we're doing business, the prices they're paying now, never mind the prices they're likely to pay in the future, make us uh, a cheaper and cleaner alternative. So, right. I mean, that's the bottom line, and I can't get into too much on the science because that's not my area of expertise. Uh, but in a lot of ways, I would just say the, the, the proof is in the pudding, and everyone who has looked at this from a risk Standpoint, particularly uh, both individual investors and the financiers who are putting up substantial amounts of money, whether it's to build a $100 million plant or $150 million plant, have concluded that this is uh, low risk and this is a good economic proposition at this point in time. Well, that's magnificent. That's good news. And I also notice we have this little blurb here on advocacy. Um, Ed Rendell, the ex-governor of Pennsylvania, is part of your board of advisors, is that correct? Yes. Uh, yeah, Governor Rendell is uh, on our board of advisors, and I would add that he's a very, very enthusiastic uh, supporter. And, you know, he, and I know from so many conversations uh, with him that he's a huge one of the reasons he's a huge proponent of uh, OTEC and uh, renewable energy in general is because he sees it as being a key issue uh, for us to get, as I said before, on the leading edge of from an economic standpoint 
because it can do what it can do for our economy. Um, so yeah, he he has been uh, he has been a, a, a great supporter and very helpful uh, going forward here. Yeah, I've heard him speak a couple of times. I was at the Renewable Energy Finance Forum in New York City last fall, and he did a, just a fantastic. What a public speaker! I guess you know you, you better be good on your feet. Uh, being a governor of a state, but I'll tell you what, he's a fantastic speaker, and really, the, the passion and sincerity that he has for this thing really comes through. Well, and you know, on this point, at, uh, I'm sorry, on this point, Craig, let, let me add, as, as far as Ed Rendell goes, that um, Ed Rendell's involvement here as an advocate is really just the, the tip of the iceberg. Iceberg. I mean, as I said, Ed Rendell uh, feels passionately about getting our national deficit under control and growing our economy is one way to do that through renewable energy. But there are other advocates out there um, for OTEC uh, from all kinds of different walks of life, including uh, Congressman Chris Carney, um, who uh, left Congress in 2011. Uh, Chris was a congressman from Pennsylvania. He's a recognized national security expert. He actually served as a counterterrorism analyst in the Bush White House as well. And um, people like Chris, uh, who are you know, obviously high profile and understand national security, they understand that moving away from oil dependency, and not just in the United States, but around the world, is critical to enhancing international and national security. If you consider that a place like Iran, uh, which uh, uh, I don't need to go over Iran's track record and the concerns about Iran, but a place like Iran gets about 60% of its uh, operating funds from oil revenues. So right. to the extent that the price of oil uh, continues to go up, it just... Uh, it, is, is not uh, good for international security. And to the, conversely, to the extent that we can get OTEC around the world as an alternative to the oil dependency uh, can only help um, uh, reduce global demand for oil and therefore uh, help reduce the price or at least contain the price as much as possible. Well, that's fantastic. Uh, that's about the size of it. We've had... Um We've had a couple of good questions here. Um, would you, Jim, is there anything you'd like to say in summary here? Um, the only other thing I would say is that the, the, the reason that we are all so excited about this is because truly OTEC has the capacity to be a global game changer um, in terms of energy, uh, in terms of water, and the other thing, we only mentioned this before, you know, the sustainable fish farming that can be done using that cold deep ocean water, that, that, that's a huge benefit as well. So if you look at it from a big picture standpoint, Craig, that OTEC is a technology that can be done around the world. Uh, you know, if you consider the tropics and subtropics where we can do OTEC with waste tea, we're looking at 4 billion people. Uh, living in that wide band, but you're talking about a technology that can bring clean energy, uh, fresh drinking water, and sustainable food production to places all around the world, or to put it another way, allow these communities to become independent and self-sustaining using their local resources, everything that's right there in the ocean. And, the, you know, whenever this topic comes up, I can't help but think of the ancient proverb that says, uh, give a man a fish, you feed him for a day, teach a man how to fish, and you feed him for a lifetime. And what we're talking about here is giving these communities the ability to be truly self-sustaining. Uh, and we really had uh, one high-level official say to us, we want to be, real, and these were his words, we want to be released from the tyranny of oil. That was wow. expression. Nice. And, and lots of places feel that, feel that way. There is a heightened sense of urgency out there right now among our customers who understand, rightly so, 
that the time is now to act, that they need to manage by foresight <laughs> rather than wait for the, uh, a crisis to happen. Um, uh, you know, I don't know if I mentioned this before, but we had one in, uh, utility executive at one point say to us that uh, if oil goes back to $140 a barrel and stays there for any sustained period, it will spell the economic catastrophe for this community. Yeah. Um, and, the, and his comments are, I am confident in saying, very reflective of so many places around the world where we can do where we can do OTEC. So it really is. It's it's a global game changer, and it's an exciting time to be pushing it forward and uh, you know helping it fulfill the the amazing promise that it has. Well, that's fantastic, Jim. Thanks so much. Um, it was it's I've been a real joy getting to know you and working with you on this thing. And again, if any if any of our listeners want to contact you, just um, you, you they can go to your website or to mine, twogreenenergy.com. Just hit contact, and I'll make sure everything gets forwarded to you. Great. Well, I appreciate Thanks you so having much me. Thanks for being Craig. here. Take care now. Talk to you again Bye. soon.